Uh, it was the first time in my life working with Dr. Miller that I felt, uh, I almost start to cry talking about this because it, it's the first time I felt like someone liked the parts about me that really were hard for me, that I had run away from my whole life. Welcome to Adulting on the Spectrum. In this podcast, we want to highlight voices of autistic adults, people like us talking about their day-to-day -day life. Basically, we want to give a voice to a variety of autistic people. I'm Eileen Lam, an autistic author and photographer, and I co-host this podcast with Andrew Camro. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Eileen. I'm an autistic entrepreneur and co-host of this podcast. Today, our guest is John Frizzell. Award-winning composer John Purcell, born in New York City, began his musical journey with early choral roles at the Paris Opera and Metropolitan Opera Companies. From teenage rock band to jazz studies, he found his calling after meeting mentor Joe Pass. His lasting collaboration with Mike Judge began with Beavis and Butthead, Do America, followed by Office Space, one of the best movies of all time. I added that part. And more earning accolades, including an HMMA for Beavis and Butthead Do the Universe. Frizzell's TV work include King of the Hill, The Following, and Netflix's Space Force. Beyond his music, he's contributed to film institutions and lectures. And today, John is disclosing his autism diagnosis on our podcast, Adulting on the Spectrum. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. So we want to start, uh, we'd like to start our podcast by asking each guest how they prefer to identify, um, whether it's autistic, on the spectrum, person with autism, I don't have a preference, or I haven't even had time to think about it. Do you have a preference? I, I like autistic. I am autistic. I, you know, looking at a Leo Kanner, you know, choosing the word autism from the Greek self. I think he, the implication was someone who, uh, you know, prefers to be in isolation, which is definitely describes me. So I, I don't think of it as something I have, as I, I think of it as something I am. I can't imagine me apart from it. I, I like if I run a scenario in my head of me apart from the way I am. It's not me. So that did that make any sense? Yeah, it'd be very weird. And uh, can you tell us about your? autism diagnosis journey it's uh i'm sure there is a lot there but for it. yeah i mean this is kind of um i mean revealing it getting autistic getting getting assessed getting diagnosed it's kind of like the end of sort of a 50-year a meltdown or a 50-year nightmare it, it it feels like i'm coming home um it, it's really emotional for me because uh, i really spent a half a century really lost on this planet just trying to figure out what was going on. It wasn't pleasant. Um, and um, maybe in the year, I have a few notes here, but I think it was around 99 or, or 2000. Um, let me just silence this so I don't get anything in here. Sorry about that. Um, around the year 2000, in the early days of the internet, I was just playing around with an IQ test with some friends and we were all like seeing who could get the highest score. And then it linked me to an autism test. And I took the test and it said I was autistic. And I thought I knew nothing of autism. And I, and I actually just sort of made fun of it and didn't think anything of it and thought, what, a, what, what you know, this test doesn't, isn't set up right and stuff. And I knew nothing of it. I had absolutely no knowledge. And, but it really sat with me. And I kept wondering, well, what, what was that test really about? And little things would come up and I would read about Asperger's over the years. I go, huh, that, that, that sounds a little bit like me. Um, and then it was things really peaked for me during the beginning of the pandemic when I realized how much I liked the isolation, how much I didn't miss being around people and how texting and writing, just being able to just text to people and not having any contact was so much clearer and easier for me and less stressful. And then I, maybe I think I Googled that or something. I was reading about it and I thought, wait a minute here, you know, and, and things started to click together. And it all kind of came to uh, a head at one point when someone became really upset with 
my tone of voice. And 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 I, and I said, well, what's upsetting? And they said I that I was coming off as as too too harsh or too direct. And and I looked kind of inside myself, and and it was a total mismatch. Like nothing inside of me had anything to do with the way I was being perceived. And and I was just totally struck by this by this complete mismatch in how I intended to to display myself, how I wanted to present myself, and how I was being perceived. And and I knew right then it just clicked in my head. I could see myself for a moment from the inside and the outside. And I knew right then I, I was onto something. And that's when I started seeking out uh, getting getting actually assessed and diagnosed. Hindsight is is twenty twenty. If you you know look back when you were you know a child or you know young adult teenager, are there things that you almost laugh at now, or or maybe not there yet, but just you know where that was such a manifestation of your autism? Yeah, there's a lot. So. Uh, getting the childhood things kind of messy um and i'll get there in a, the, the 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 i forgot to add in that last part is to that's when i found my way to uh, uh i'm going to look up um the doctor's name again because he was really great um but uh jason miller i found a doctor named jason miller and that's who i did the diagnosis with and uh, it, it's an interesting process too of just all the questions and the interviews and it's i, I kind of found it intriguing and interesting um, but I just wanted to put that out there for people that are sort of thinking about how, this how long was it? How long did it take you? And, and what, what did they do? Because um, lots of people, even as adults, seem to have different experiences, you know. Um, so if you if you want to just share. Yeah, all in, it was, I think, about three months from the beginning, from the first first contacting uh, Dr. Miller, who's a big Beavis and Butthead fan. So it was it was uh, it was, it, you know, he was fun talking to him. Um, there was a bunch of paperwork to fill out that I filled out. My partner, Nicole, filled out. My son filled stuff out. We both we all wrote a bunch of pages. Then I think there was a first a video conferencing and then there was an, a meeting and there was quite a big gap in between the, each step. And then there was uh, uh, going into the office and doing all these tests and puzzles and stuff. And I love that stuff. I think that's just, you know, that's that's where I'm, I'm really having a good time. So. Um, and then there was another delay and then then I get this report and then go in and talk about it. And I think the after getting diagnosed and going in and talking to him, uh, it was the first time in my life working with Dr. Miller that I felt, uh, I almost start to cry talking about this because it, it's the first time I felt like someone liked the parts about me that really were hard for me, that I had run away from my whole life. And, and I felt like I, I was home. I felt like I had this this nightmare was ending. That's beautiful. And I can so relate to to what you're saying. Uh, I felt the same way when I was diagnosed because everything started to make sense. And all of the things that people used to, you know, bully me for finally like at, at a name, you know, and all of these things, they were like, now I kind of embrace them, you know, like being creative. The fact that I like music from the 1930s when the kids back then in the 90s were listening to what was on the radio at that time. And now I, I like that my interests are out of the box, for instance, and, you know, that I can talk too much. And sometimes I just want to be alone for weeks at a time. And all of the things that made me weird now are just kind of like, but this is me, you know, and it has a name and it, it makes sense. So, yeah, I get that the coming home part. I like how you said it. And I agree with that. I experienced what I, I think also a fair amount of other people experienced, which was maybe not a good period before. Maybe, you know, guilt at first of how things could have been different. Right. Or yeah. could I have known sooner? Um, and just like a lot of I got to the point where you guys are i'm absolutely there now it, it, it took a few months but also just for people to say i don't think that's too uncommon too where it can just be so much to process um yeah. that it's kind of a, a journey to to getting there but we, we hope everyone gets there yeah yeah it, it was very powerful um i'm grateful that i'm, I'm gonna get you know that i have a good chunk of life here i hope <laughs> Hopefully I'll be a composer, not a decomposer. I can keep keep composing, um, live some life as an autistic person, you know. Um, 
the uh, so you were asking Andrew about childhood stuff. So I'll go through this quickly. My, my childhood was just a train wreck. My dad, um, someone tried to murder my dad when I was three on our front doorstep. Um, he was stabbed in the neck and the back. He had open heart surgery. He survived physically, but the PTSD and the mental issues created just a web of total chaos. So I think most of what happened to me, you know, that my house was just, it was a very dangerous place. Um, and so I don't have a lot of clear memories and no one was really looking out after me. It was more like just sort of trying to get through it. And so I think that my, my autistic traits were probably overshadowed. Um, I do remember uh, really intense tantrums. I really, I remember being dragged to kindergarten the first time and just my mom couldn't even get me out of the car. So just going back home and trying it over and over until I would eventually go in. And once I started to go, I, I could, I could handle it. You know, um, I think a big escape for me was sitting at the piano and I would, I would at probably four or five years old, I didn't know how to play yet, but I would sort of tell stories. I would just, I was just fascinated with the sound. I was just captivated with the sound. And I would make sounds of dinosaurs. I'd make sounds of rabbits. I would make stories up and I would tell these stories. Just all my emotions would come out through just creating these weird, these, these sounds that weren't really tonal, but it was just, it was sort of, it's funny because that's exactly all I do today. It's all I've ever done in my whole life. So um, it was weird that I just sort of born that way. <laughs> so wild to me that you didn't learn to play piano until you were like four or five, because I feel like you hear, you know, you're really amazing at music. And I'm going to ask you about this in just a minute. But I feel like that's something in my head I pictured as a, you know, you sit on the piano as a toddler and you know how to play type of thing, not as something you learn. Like, how did you go from being five and not knowing how to play to the career uh, you had? And while you're at it, can you tell us about some of the movies you worked on, your favorite music, all of that? Yeah, I'll sort of walk through like music in in my life, you know, so it, I think it goes from from that early st stuff at the piano. I, I can remember my dad was was quite a, an exceptional piano player. I can, I can remember putting my hands on top of his hands when he would play and just like riding his hands around. I'm not a piano. Piano is not my first instrument. I'm a, I'm a marginal pianist at best. I'm a guitar player. Um, but then I started singing and that's when I I, at school, I would sing at church, and and I would, and I eventually got hired to sing in, in professional choir, choirs with the Metropolitan Opera and the Paris Opera Company. And I was just captivated with the sound of opera with these huge orchestras. It it literally, I mean, it just it was so scrumptious. I can't I can't give you any other word for the sound. It just literally transported me. I think that I have I do have pretty intense auditory sensitivity. But I think in the same way a sound can be extent like much more negative for me, I think it can also be much more positive so that I can get these almost almost just like like dreamlike states from music um, where it's just it's so it feels so good it's hard to describe it. Um, but then my voice cracked when I was like 12 years old and um, I went into rehearsal one day and and my voice cracked one time and they called my mom the next thing i know i'm on the little league field just playing baseball and she said singing was over and it was over i never sang again and um a few years later i started playing the guitar and fell in love with that and um really became quite obsessed with the guitar um like you eileen i started listening to music that wasn't from my generation and i became obsessed with uh, like django reinhardt it's music from the 1930s and 40s and then i went to usc music school to play jazz um and then to manhattan school of music and then i found my way uh to an assistant in a recording studio and i did tv commercials and then i got an opportunity to work with ryuichi sakamoto the great composer who recently passed he was just an, an amazing person an amazing composer and i got to work with him on a mini series called wild palms that oliver stone made and I did all these I took did all ran all his synthesizers and took his compositions and and sort of realized them on synthesizer for that series mini series. And that's where I fell in love with writing to picture. I came to LA at that point. I was in New York when I worked for Ryuichi. And I came and I started working um here and I, I got to collaborate with a composer named James Newton Howard, who was incredible in mentoring me, and um did Dante's Peak, some other movies. 
that led to uh, the fourth Alien movie on my own um, with Jean-Pierre Genet um, and a bunch of other movies. Beavis and Butthead came along around that time. And then you can go and look at INDB. That's where I started really working. When I, when I started working a lot and I didn't have to think about socializing, that's my life did get a lot better when I could just be in a room like I'm in now. I'm in a, in a recording room. And the sound in here is makes me very comfortable and happy, and um, and this is where I've spent a big chunk of my life, you know, just alone in a room writing music. That's what I like to do. That's incredible, and you know, you've been sharing all of these things about your diagnosis, which no one knew about until today. And I'm wondering, why did you decide to make your diagnosis public on our podcast, which we're so so honored about, obviously. Yeah, it just it's just time. It's time. Um uh I don't I can't really go on masking. I I just don't want to do it anymore. I'm tired. It just makes me tired. I've started to realize how much it takes out of me. Um I'm probably going to do it during this podcast some. I mean, I'm hopefully I'm I'm going to let you see how I how I am. Um but I but it's such a habit. It's I'm so sort of conditioned to try to assimilate um you know if, if anyone wants to really come and sit around my house and for for eight hours and watch me go through a book about philosophy or do chess puzzles they can do that and but but uh, i um and the other thing is is i've become very uh, focused on autistic employment as i started to read about the statistics and the rates of what's going on with autistic employment and um, it's just time to get involved with with everybody. It's in time time for me to get involved with other autistic people and see if some of the things that have worked for me and how I kind of fumbled my way. I've pretty much fumbled my way through life, but it did work in a lot of ways. Can and can I take some of my fumbling through and 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 use it to have other people in our community maybe not you know trip over themselves as bad as I have in places. Um, I think it's, I think, I think I have things that can be used and, um, and I think I can contribute to, uh, autistic employment is probably the first place I'd like to start. If you had any either quick tips or things that you did before your diagnosis and maybe some things that changed after your diagnosis. Uh... I have to focus on. That if you that if that if you, for autistic people maybe if you have the possibility to think about different types of jobs that may be better suited to you as an individual, uh, maybe stir towards one of those. Um, for instance, I don't I could never be around people all day in an office. I would last, you know, two days max, and um, I wouldn't I wouldn't make it. Um, and so from so, I think that that if if it's possible to try to find and 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 um, and look for places that you can make decisions in your own life that are going to gear steer you towards a job that's going to be functional for you because not I, you know for me not every job would work at all very few um, and I know that's not it's it's a really difficult thing and and that we that we shouldn't have to have the world conform back that we shouldn't have to have jobs that we can't do um, but it's a difficult thing and and um, there's just so few settings that I can see myself as being functional in outside of what I do. It's so specific um, because of, because I just like to be alone and, and being alone and writing music just works. Now, did I answer your question, Andrew? I don't know if I did. Yeah, no, no, that was great. Thank you. And, uh, you know, something we don't talk about enough, and maybe it's because I'm the only person who was uh, positively impacted by that. But to me, the, the pandemic had a big positive effect on my life in the sense that I was able to get my first real job. And that's because uh, I'm the same way as you, John. I can't be in an office. It's just, it's hell. And so I didn't get a job until I was uh, 31. I mean, a job in the sense people think about a job, a nine to five, you know? I was doing my photography and writing and all of that, but a real, and if you can see me, I'm doing the little quotation on real job. That wasn't until the pandemic because I was able to work remote and to not have to deal with uh, with people. And uh, I mean, I, I love my coworkers, don't get me wrong, but I love them 
more, I think, because we're not in the same room and it gives me the opportunity to interact with them more on like on my my timeline. And I think that's going to help a lot of autistic people. I know it's helped me and uh, yeah, I, I really hope that's not something that's going to go away just because we're back to in-person gathering. So John, you, you shared with me that your friends call you a useless information man. Um, can you share your favorite useless fact with us? I, I, I love useless facts. Um, I thought about this and we did talk about this, so we cheated a little bit. But there was a, a, a scientist named Claude Shannon who was at Bell Labs who's considered one of the real pioneers of information theory. And Claude Shannon invented the useless box. And the useless box is a box that does something, but the something that it does is nothing. Okay. okay. So if everyone wants to just, you probably, I'm hoping everyone's going to like Google useless, yes, Claude, Claude Shannon useless box. And I really encourage buying one because it's the most useless way you could ever spend a small sum of money. And it makes a great gift. Oh and, my God. Um, I have one of those. I didn't know that it you was have one? that. Yeah. That is yeah, so, so what it does. I'll give it away. So what it does is it has a switch. And when you press the switch, a little handle comes off and it turns itself off. So all the machine does is when you turn it on, it turns itself off. I just, I, I, I can watch it for hours. I'm just fascinated with the idea of this, you know, self-referential machine that turns itself off. That's all it does. It's so brilliant. I, I have no words to describe it. Um, but, but like information for me is kind of like food. I just, I can sit and just, you know, I'll get on a subject. Like, did you see the new um, Indiana Jones movie about, Either of you see it? I actually have not seen that one. Nope. So it's about this device called the Antikythera mechanism. And I don't know, about six or seven years ago, I got onto that. And, you know, I might spend like a year and a half reading about that. And I know way too much about that. But I, 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 I'll, I'll just get, I love to get on these subjects where I just get, go down them. And, and Nicole will ask me to not talk about it for more than 10 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. I want to go on and on and on and on. And I do that with philosophy too. I can, I can, I love to, it isn't that I so much like philosophy as much as I like to do philosophy. It's like something, it's like an activity. It's like, I love to sort of think about a subject and think about, well, you know, what does this mean? And, and you can, and you can actually do the act of philosophizing, you know? So, so to me, that's, that's just, you know, if I couldn't have been a composer, you know, I probably would put on a toga and walk around like Socrates. But, um, but I, I just, I real, but I also, but ser on a serious note about philosophy, I, I do have a great love for it, and I do think that um, there is that it's underutilized in our culture and our education, and um, I also have a strong sense that autistic people throughout history have contributed a lot to philosophy and that there is um, sort of a way out of our predicament, perhaps our modern predicament within philosophy. I think it's something that, that um, Ludwig Wittgenstein pointed out, who um, a lot of people think that Wittgenstein may have been on the spectrum as well. Um, and, and a lot of it has to do with our relationship with language where Wittgenstein talked about you know what a fly bottle is? It's like a bottle that has a little opening and a fly can fly up into it, but then flies don't find their way out of it. And he was just sort of, he would sort of say that language had trapped us the way a fly bottle traps a fly and that we had become so consumed in trying to find absolute truth in language that we had, we had become trapped in this and that he was there to, to, that philosophy was there to sort of guide us back out of the opening. And I mean, it was kind of funny because he said that we're basically flies, which is very Wittgenstein too, is that, um, but, but um, I don't know, that's my very long winded answer on useless information, man. Um, I could, I could take any philosophical subject and spend two days on it be very happy so is glow in the dark a color or a property it's a color yes darn no it's a color it's a perceived because because it's a it's a perception and so um i mean i mean you know the the way if you look at the way 
I think in ancient Greece, they thought that the, the first theory on how we perceive color was that our lights, act, our eyes actually emanated sort of like a laser, and that that laser then then somehow illuminated the objects. But then that 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 whole idea really didn't work. Um, but then it, it gets more complicated when you think that like a red apple isn't red; it's not red. It's so the red is the only thing that comes back at you. So to perceive glow in the dark, something has to be coming back at us and be a perception. So I would call that a color. You're I guess right you here. could maybe call it a perception. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm lost, but what I, I, I don't know why I trust you. You sound like you, you know I, what you're I, talking about. I don't know. I'm just trying to get someone to disagree with me because I'm kind of full of it. But um, I mean, well, I think that's the correct answer. So I'm not going to disagree at all. Thank you. Well, I disagree, okay. but I don't have any way to explain why I disagree. So I'm not going to be a very good. Uh, so yeah. you're in the it's not a color camp. Yeah, to me, it's a property, but like I can't really explain it like with as much confidence as, as you just did. Oh, wait a minute. Well, maybe maybe colors are properties. Uh, well, yeah, they are. I mean, like right. rectangles and squares. Yeah, it can be both. So maybe it's both. Then is the answer. Is a property and a color. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think it ultimately is semantic at a certain point. Um, I mean, if I have to go back to Wittgenstein again, you know, it's that 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 the idea is that there there are things that are true that can't be said, right? And so that so that maybe the 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 language we're using to represent this is just simply representing it and not fully and completely expressing it. It's kind of the way. I know we've diverged a lot, but it's fun. Um, that it's kind of the way I view language is like I think of it, and I've argued with 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 uh, linguists about this quite a bit is that I view language as literally a tool. In other words, it's not it is it is simply like a screwdriver. And, and the, the best word is the word which has the most function in the in the in the, in the given situation, which expresses what you need to do, which. Um, and so I view I view language purely functionally. So it doesn't really it can if it's serving its purpose, then it's the right word. So I could see it as sometimes that a property might be the most functional description and a color might be most functional in other situations. What is something you wish employers in Hollywood knew about autistic individuals? Do you think employers could be more inclusive of autistic adults, especially in Hollywood? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I'm going to... I think what I should do is just so I because I'm kind of new to all this and I'm really processing autism. You know, I've, I've got to get a few more years of really of processing of trying to really wrap my head around how I relate to it, meeting a lot of people, seeing how it relates. So I don't just come off with, with vague opinions that don't end up being useful. Um, I wish more people did that. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. what is the effect? Uh, it's it's two names combined at the effect where you're brand new to something and you think you know everything and the more an expert you become, the more you realize you don't know. I can't remember the name of it now, but. Yeah. I mean, the good thing I have is enthusiasm coming out of the gate, having spent half a century not knowing about myself, but I, I have to be a little guarded and, 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 and I, about the fact that I'm, I am enthusiastic and know that that's probably going to be largely misguided in certain ways. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of, uh, you know, watch out for me, if you know what I mean. Um, but, <laughs> the, um, okay, so I, I think I'm going to narrow the scope of it to what I know, just because it's what I know. So what I know is I've only really worked in Hollywood, and I've only worked in a freelance position in a very specific type of job where I'm given a direction, I'm given creative instruction, and then the theory, I go off and I do this. And then in the end, I deliver this thing I've created and I take notes on it and I revise it until it matches the creative vision of the team. Um, that's the type of job I think I can talk about, right? And I think that that also applies for people in sound, probably editing, probably costume designers. There's probably a whole bunch of other jobs. Um, I think the first problem going on is that our, the, aut the autistic, the, the positives of autistic people are understated and not known, right? And I, I made a list right here. Let me just grab this because um, they're, they're really quite powerful when you, when you look at them. I mean, if you just even Google it. So 
honesty, strong focus, detail orientation, intelligence, strong morals, unique sense of humor and loyalty. These are probably something that every autistic person can put at the top of their re resume is that it's, it's, it's a lot about us. So that being at the top of a resume should bump it pretty far up, right? But I don't think that gets out there. Um, and then the second thing is uh, the personal interview to me can turn into a social conformity test. And what I mean is a lot of the time, I think things get down to several applicants and the work has been evaluated. You've gone through the resume and you're down to a couple applicants. And then someone making the decision has a meeting and they gauge their feeling from the meeting. The problem is we tend to be off-putting in a meeting because of very subliminal issues. And any issue isn't even the right words, but subliminal things like eye contact, breathing, body posture, interrupting, pace, all this little stuff. And that is a statistical problem in the process because it's going to, I think if you, to me, what's going to happen is autistic people are going to get filtered out. Definitely. I mean, the, yeah. And I'm not one to say that it's something is ableist because that word I feel like is being thrown around uh, too much. But, you know, like, like you just said, eye contact. I mean, I would struggle so hard to make eye contact with the person in front of me, but that doesn't mean I don't have the skills for the job, yet it's going to be held against me in the interview process. And I think there are several, I mean, it's getting out there that the interview process is not autistic friendly. And I think things are, are going to change. Um, let's hope. But I, I, I do think that, um, it's not made for autistic people and people are starting to realize it. So let's wait okay. and see. Yeah. So do you have any, uh, uh, adjustment or accommodation for, uh, employers in the workplace, what would uh, benefit autistic people in your world? Because I know you don't want to speak yeah, about yeah. a world you don't know. I mean, I, I'm once once I start working, I'm I'm pretty comfortable. Um, and again, I think if I started to talk about I can imagine other types of jobs where uh, people could be where employers could be conscious of things like lighting, noise. Um, uh, sort of surprise meetings because I like to be prepared. So, so you know, I, I like to have like a little time, a notice if something's going to happen, but things have to be flexible. But, uh, you know, the physical environment, I think, is important for me. I couldn't, you know, sound is is so, it can really throw me off and, and, and light too um, can really throw me off. So just from a physical place, that would be something I think would be hugely appropriate to start with. I, I think I've mentioned it before on this podcast that, uh, Currently, although it's delayed a little longer than we'd like, uh, we I do have a book hopefully coming out within the next year or so on uh, why your next employee should be autistic. Um, oh, I so like that. I, I'm doing a lot of research with being my co-author on, on that subject. Um, done, a, done a lot of it. So it's, it's interesting. Um, there's so many different avenues and seeing things from other people's perspectives and all the employment programs that have been around and it makes so much sense. Why isn't everyone doing it? Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a very interesting topic. Would love to talk to you more about that sometime. So Yeah, I mean, if you think about how many huge ideas have come from autistic brains, um, we're, we're really, really are, I, I, I'm, I'm going to just, I don't know, we're very valuable. And, and that value just needs, needs more recognition. Um, and, and it, 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 it's uh, it's going to just take a lot of people getting out there. I don't know what it takes. I really don't know what it takes. Eileen, what does it take? I mean, there are many strengths that come with hiring autistic employees, but also some struggles. And yourself, you're a musician, composer, and you said it yourself. There are some uh, sensory struggles like noise sensitivity. That seems like a big, big challenge for a composer, right? So how do you balance the sensitivities with performing your job? Yeah, um, 
So in my job, the the quality sound that we the, the sound that we work with professionally is usually sound which is really pleasant to me. Sometimes I'll be working on a film, which is you're you're mixing the film it's in, and where we put the sound effects and the music together. And sometimes it is very loud, and I do wear I will wear earplugs uh, when we're doing that. But a lot of people actually do that too. So for me, sound is problematic when it's a, when it's you see these things behind me that it's called a diffuser that thing and so what it does is it makes it so there are no standing waves so when waves when sound waves bounce across the wall that they don't create these sort of static buildups in the middle that feels very uncomfortable to me so the nice thing is is in my work in in film and tv you're mostly in a treated room and it and it, most of the rooms i'm in feel really good um getting back to some of the other problems i did find there was a book i read right when i got my diagnosis called an adult with an autism diagnosis a guide for the newly diagnosed i i've got some quotes here from chapter six autism in the workplace um uh many people here's a quote and this is by author um gillen drew many people with autism struggle to understand how we were supposed to act in a work environment um, you are meant to have a certain amount of small talk or chit chat with your colleagues to break down barriers, build trust, and foment a positive working relationship. But many people on the spectrum find this incredibly difficult or even pointless. Um, the tendencies can be to raise inappropriate or complex subjects for discussion, which instead of easing relationships with others actually strain them. I'm really good at that. Um, many of the issues we have with our co-workers stem from a combination of difficulties in understanding social rules. Um, and here's a key one. Because of this, we can run roughshod over people's feelings. <laughs> this lack of attention to people's feelings when they hinder the goal or task that we're performing is a very common feature of autism. So do, those, do you, I mean, do you, what do you think of those quotes from that book? I can relate. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah, I can relate. I definitely, I mean, it's, it describes me. It's uncanny how it described me. So, um, yeah. What's so the there, book, the book's title again? So people can, uh, yeah, find... let me get it for you. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. It's in here. Okay. Here's the title of the book, an adult with an autism diagnosis, a guide for the newly diagnosed by Gillen, G I L L A N drew. D R E W. It was a really helpful book to me when I first got my diagnosis. Um, so, so some of these things are, are interesting to look at. I tend to be, um, you know, when I'm when I'm saying what I think, I'm I'm I don't sugarcoat my language. I'm very direct, too direct. Um, I like to use language almost like a, like mechanically, like a like I will when I'm when I'm if if I'm working with a director and they give me a note on what to fix, I literally take that language and I convert it almost to a math problem because I want to get it exactly right. I want to do I want to get into the music as precisely as I can, the emotion they want in the scene. And and I think this I, I kind of I, I get so focused on that that I that I that I I don't I put that above everything else in the room. And sometimes, uh, you know, it's it's just it, it comes off as too direct too 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 harsh. Yeah, but there's value in people being direct. Uh, I think neurotypical people tend to, and I, I understand, you know, try and not hurt other people's feelings so much that sometimes the message they're trying to get across just doesn't make it to the other person. And uh, I've experienced that quite a bit in my life where because people are not being direct, I don't understand the message. And now it's always confusing to me. <laughs> Something really funny happened at work uh, uh, last week or the last few months, actually. Um, I I told uh, someone who's been working at uh, Autism Speaks, because that's where I work, for 15 years that I couldn't pronounce her name, Kathy. And she told me, I can, uh, well, that's okay. You can call me Kate. I've always wanted to be called Kate anyway. So I just rolled with it, right? I called her Kate and I told everyone, oh, by the way, did you know Kathy wants to be called Kate now? And uh, turns out it was a joke. And so I uh, accidentally <laughs> changed her name <laughs> to Kate. She had been working there for 15 years 
and she went from Kathy to Kate. <laughs> and I did I just didn't pick up on the on the joke. She was just you you yeah. you took the language like verbatim like this was yeah. yeah. She was just trying to I, sometimes I, I see yeah. I'm sorry, Andrew, go ahead. Yeah, I, I had one similar where um my, my best friend at the time was telling me that his employee was um her name was Bridget instead of Bridget. Um and he didn't tell her that he was doing that. So this went on for about six months where I made a special effort to call her Bridget, and he managed to not first laughing out loud the entire time. So, and, and then eventually I think she found out before I did, but and my wife even told me, I don't think that's true. I'm like, no, it looks like Bridget, but it, you say Bridget. <laughs> No, no. So. On the other side, I was in Spain. I, I tend to sometimes I will say jokes so dryly that people don't they don't pick up that there's any humor in it. And I was it was New Year's in Spain. I was with a friend who didn't speak any Spanish. And I, he said, how do you say Happy New Year's? And I said, well, you just say Buenos Anus. And he was running around yelling Buenos Anus and uh, just getting these very strange reactions. And I just sat there just trying not to laugh the whole time. It was pretty good. But yeah, so so it can go two ways. And sometimes I, I get so dry with, you know, with sarcasm. I love sarcasm. It's like my favorite thing in the world. I love just really cutting words that just, um, that's what sarcasm actually means, by the way. I, I, I lean in myself for both uh, very sarcastic. I think that's why we get along well, which is not always or probably is not usually associated with autism, right? Yeah. Totally. But it's funny because we're very sarcastic, but we don't always pick up on other other people's sarcasm, you know, like for me, I should have picked up that when she told me it's OK, you can call me Kate. That was a joke, but I didn't yet, you know, among ourselves and with other people, we're highly sarcastic. So it's yeah, it's a very, very interesting how it. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just and it has a lot to do with language. I mean, there's weird things like did you did you know that like the word gullible is not an actual word? It's not in the dictionary. It's not. Wonder is <laughs> got you. I got you. <laughs> oh, okay, got it. yeah, okay, okay. We're taking you seriously. Yep, got it. Okay, you're good. It's Absolutely. Good surprise. I've used that joke so many times. It's just ridiculous, but that's a good you're one. Good. You know, you can go out and use it. It's a fun one. Yeah, yeah. so proud. I think I read a study once that that people who are more gullible or more creative is that is that if you have the ability to let go of what you conceive of, like if you're willing to be sort of almost tricked into an idea, that it it's really actually a positive trait that you actually you're um you you, you that you have this flexibility of mind, you know, is that you're able to let go of what you your preconceived notions. Well, yeah, remember so. what we were talking about uh, the other day about how autistic people are not as likely to follow the social norms uh, as other other people. I forget if that was part of a study. Do you remember that? You, John? Um, oh, yeah. No, absolutely. The the um, I I think that I just don't get them. Quite honestly. Um, probably the same way Eileen you were saying that the music you listened to wasn't from your generation is that is that I kind of just sort of gravitate to what I like I don't really um I, I don't really perceive this current that I'm supposed to be in or following um I, I, I like maybe that's I don't know does that and does that sound like something which is common yeah yeah I think we care less about what other people think and it's more like you know if we like something we like it and eh, we don't care you know maybe other people have more of a yeah they feel like they have to fit in more i don't know but that's definitely very very interesting i would love to do see one of those social experiments where like you don't know who's autistic and who's not to see who's gonna follow in with the crowd and who's not gonna follow i bet oh, i now remember what you yeah, that that would be really fascinating to see an actual study where I think I know the study you're talking about now. I'm trying to think of the name of it, Eileen, um, of where uh, there's there's four or five people and there's some lines and they show them lines and they have to identify which line is the is the is the similar length. And if the group then picks something irrational, 
a lot of people will actually go along with the group. They will actually give up what they know to be rationally true. Uh, I'm trying to think of it. Well, we'll have to put this maybe in the notes of the podcast to, to give a link to that because it is quite fascinating. Um, and it would be it would be very interesting to me to see if autistic people were less likely to um, give in to social pressures when they were illogical. Yeah, not totally. So, John, I know, you know, you've had a tough time, you know, not knowing about your autism diagnosis and trying to figure it all out. But has there been, has there been a person that's been a big support in your life? Like, how did you handle it all? Yeah, well, um, my partner, Nicole, and my son have kind of paved the way for me. Um, and... I think that the, I, that the 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 lucky thing in my life is that I was able to I'm able to be in a in a family now where um I can I can relax into being me you know is that if I it, you know that that Nicole might say to me she can tell when I'm getting kind of overloaded and overstimulated and and um and that I just need a little chill time you know I need a little space um, and, and sometimes that comes in the form of humor is I really, I really don't mind being teased at all. I kind of like being teased, you know, um, if, if it's done with love. And so there's a lot of good humor in, in my family. And, um, and so, um, it does, it does give me, I mean, the best thing in my life is, is that, is that I'm, you know, having a family that loves me and being, having the room to be me, which is autistic a lot of the time. I think that's probably one of the biggest things that, you know, came out of my diagnosis and uh, my, my wife supporting me is, is just knowing that I need time and I'll come back um, and giving me, giving myself or giving me just, just that time. Right. So that was very well said. Yeah. Fine. And it's something I'm learning about, I was reading today about sort of the the health cost of masking is that masking you know mm -hmm. the stress caused by masking it can shorten your lifespan it's not healthy um and so i need time to just you know do my thing yeah i mean that makes and sense it's stressful you know when you're always like trying to be someone you're not and trying to fit in when you don't want to uh, fit in trying to think about what's the right thing to do according to society I mean, that's why I would never take a job in an office because I know I, I just would be so, so, so exhausted. I was never able to get my uh, bachelor degrees in a in-person university because I couldn't be in person. You know, the crowd, the people everywhere, all the masking, and it was just like hell. I tried three years in a row because I, I don't like to give up. I'm very stubborn. Andrew knows that. Mm -hmm. Um so, but after three years, I was like, okay, you can't do it. This is not for you. So I got my degrees online and most people were like, that's going to be harder. And it was so much easier for me just because I didn't have to deal with people and masking and all of that, you know? But, but so, I, at the same time, I can, I, I can handle the pressure. I do like pressure for, for periods of time. I just need the, I just need to counterbalance it. As far as I, I, I know a lot of the, the work you, you've done, I, I make fun of Eileen for not move, TV shows she watches more of than movies. Um, what, how is Mike Judge, and why, and how old do you, how's your relationship with him? So uh, I love working with Mike. Mike and I have known each other a very long time, and one of the great things about, especially you know, working on the on the new Beavis movie, Beavis and Butthead Do the Universe, was a was it was a it was great to go back and revisit the boys as we call them um and to um i, I think the what was so interesting to me thinking about myself differently when i was because i knew i was autistic when i was scoring that to think about sort of the the construction of humor and that it and that it's um that we sort of sit down and we and we it's almost like a math problem you're almost like designing specific very specific emotions to to point out and augment these this humor at the same time the the trick is to 
make it seem like you're it's just sort of happening very naturally um so working with mike is 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 incredibly fun for me uh he's a very close friend and um knows everything about me and um uh, it, it's a real treat so and so just so you know my my favorite uh, musical artist of all time does something similar. Uh, Nick Cave and Warren Ellis, they, they oh, do yeah. their amount of TV shows. Absolutely. So I don't know if you know, and I assume you know them, but I don't know if, uh, I mean, he's, you know, probably most famous for the, you know, theme to Scream, right? Not my yeah. favorite song by him, but kind of a, so, uh, yeah. I mean, he just had an audio book come out. I've been listening to it. It's a lot about his process. It's pretty interesting. So I got to check out, what's the book called? Yeah, uh, give me two seconds. Um, I know I, I should, should remember the name of the book. Um, uh, it is Faith, Hope, and Carnage. Cool. Yeah, sounds like him. So I did have some kind of bumpy experiences talking to in social situations, talking to medical doctors about my diagnosis as I encountered two medical doctors who in social situations, you know, were adamant that I was not autistic and I was probably had Asperger's, but definitely not autism. And it was amazing to me how the memo did not get passed through to a lot of doctors about the changes in the criteria in the DSM. Yeah, tell us about it. Um, so I just it's sort of a cautionary note is that is that if you get diagnosed and you may have situations where you talk to someone who's going to um, sort of claim to have a lot of knowledge and, and, and not understand much about autism. Um, and it happened to me with with in two different situations with medical doctors who, you know, said, oh, you're definitely not autistic. You know, you're, you you probably have Asperger's, but not autism. And I'm like, well, hey, do you understand? what the DSM says and, and, and then eventually could sort of turn them around, but it's, but it can be very off putting and it can be very uh, confusing and emotionally challenging to get that kind of reaction from people who should be acting with more knowledge and responsibility. Um, and, and if they maybe, you know, holding off if they aren't sure about something and, and waiting, but I, I think there's a large amount of that misinformation out there in the world. The memo didn't get passed along. A lot of people don't understand autism don't understand adult autism in the slightest don't under, you know they don't understand what an adult with autism might be like or act like um and and they, they probably have these very cartoonish images in their mind of what an adult with autism is going to be like and when you don't match it they're gonna say that you don't match my image of what an autistic person should be and it's and it's um it's a challenge yeah it is you know i think that's because of how broad the spectrum is and it's i think it's still hard for people to put asperger's which is now level one autism into the same uh spectrum as people who require 24 7 care every day of their life and who can't communicate at all so you know it's autism spectrum disorder is like one word that describes so many different experiences and of autism, right? If you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So I think that's where this is coming from. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something that in addition to focusing on employment stuff, I would, it would be, I think it'll help employment if there's more clarity. And I think that the question, I think the confusion that a lot of people have about Asperger's and how it relates to ASD level one is is part of the issue, you know. Yeah, I personally wish Asperger's had stayed its own diagnosis because I I relate to to it so much, and now I feel like it's just it's created confusion. How I have the same diagnosis as my son who can't communicate beyond basic needs, and you know who has no sense of danger, and so yeah. And it's it's tough. It's it's a really tough, you know, situation. And you know, the DSM is usually updated every twelve-ish years. So I think we're gonna have a new edition in the next uh, three years. I want to say, but mm -hmm. I have no idea what's gonna be in it. 
right? Is well, it kind of a surprise? I mean, I have no idea how that works. Is it? Yeah, it's a surprise. <laughs> Basically, I mean, last one was, what was it, 2011? I don't want to be wrong. I, might I, be... I thought it was 2013, but it... 2013, DSM-5. I, I could, yeah. The, uh, but the... Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's I mean, we could very well have a different term, term in the next few years. Yeah. And I think it's going to be really hard. Like, you know, people like, I mean... You know, just like people who were diagnosed with Asperger's when it was lumped in with autism, it was hard for them to be like, oh, okay, so I'm autistic now. What about us? What if they change it again? Then we're not autistic level one. We're going to be maybe something else, you know? And yeah, it's just wait and see. And even though that would be hard, I think it's so needed. And I know you're not on social media much, uh, John, but it's just that these days it's... uh it's really hard because there are a lot of people who try to completely deny the existence of severe autism and those who have, you know, much higher needs than us and who will never even have a job. And, you know, we have these issues, which are struggles, very real struggles, but this they're still not comparable to what people who are on the severe side of the spectrum experience, right? And I think uh, having a, you know, a diagnosis like Asperger's in the DSM would be a very, very useful. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. And that way, when you meet those doctors and you tell them Asperger's, you know, light bulb, like it's, you know, it, it just makes, it's a lot easier to explain when it's not lumped in with autism. But anyway, I mean, we'll talk about this for hours. Um Okay, I want to ask you some quick fire questions. I'm not even going to ask you if you have social media because I know you don't. Well, so. I think, and one of the things is I probably should, if I'm going to get more involved in autistic employment, I will begrudgingly do more social media. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, you should. Uh, let me know if you, if you need help because uh, no. that's... Uh, I need help. I'm, I'm completely... What do you know about that, Eileen? What do I know? It's like 200,000 followers, right? Quick fire questions. Yeah. Favorite animal? Dog. Favorite LA restaurant? Mmm, just a. Your favorite singer or band? Billy Holiday. Favorite food? Lobster. Favorite instrument? Cello. John Williams or Danny Heffman? Both, but John Williams. <laughs> Both, but okay. <laughs> awesome. I'm a John Williams fanatic, so I love Danny Elfman. Don't get me wrong, but I, I'm, I'm John Williams fanatic to the end. Well, thank you so much for coming on our podcast today, John, and for making your diagnosis public and sharing all of your thoughts. I mean, that was so, so in insightful. I hope you, you feel good about it. I do feel good about. It. I feel best about um and i really appreciate uh autism speaks and both of you um it really made me feel like i could do this i, I it was really quite scary for me but having watched the show and look at the care that you bring to to, to, to that I, I know i'm in good hands so um, i really appreciate it. i couldn't have done it without both of you so thank you